Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the East West Medicine Body Treatments for Pain Management webinar. My name is Sarah Dillingham, and I run a arthritis patient group called Women with Rheumatoid Disease. And I'm also a volunteer with the Arthritis Foundation. I've been living with rheumatoid arthritis for over 20 years. And like many patients, I'm always looking for new and different and better ways to treat arthritis. So I'm really excited that this evening, our guest expert is going to discuss the evidence between integrative and Chinese medicine body treatments for arthritis pain and how to get started with trying them. Okay, so events like this are informed and driven by patients like you. And that's why we'd like to share this short video about the Arthritis Foundation's Insights Program so that you can make your voice heard and help the foundation create more programs like this one. By taking part in the Live Yes Insights Assessment, you help change lives today, including your own. And you help change the future of arthritis. It takes just 10 minutes or less to share your experience and make a difference. Answer simple questions like how often you felt arthritis pain in the last week. Ongoing insights data from people like you will lead to new resources that ease daily life. Your insights show what kind of support you need in your community. You improve the healthcare system. You focus researchers and others on top priorities. You'll make more research funding possible, leading to new groundbreaking treatments. The power is in your hands to change things now and for the future. This is your opportunity to change the future of arthritis. All right, so just a note, uh, some housekeeping messages. The Arthritis Foundation has also launched its JA Insights program and it strongly encourages parents to enroll in that program as well. Before we begin, I want to just share a few announcements and notes about our event. For tonight's event, we've muted all attendees, but you can direct any questions that you may have throughout the webinar to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will reserve time to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And after tonight's session, you'll receive an email about your experience. These surveys help the Arthritis Foundation track the success of these sessions and better plan for future events. So let's get started. Tonight, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lawrence Tor. Dr. Tor is the director of the UCLA Center for East-West Medicine. Torrance. He is board certified by both the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine. Dr. Tor is also certified in Oriental Medicine, Acupuncture and Herbology by the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. As the director of the Integrative East West Inflammation Program, Dr. Tor is currently collaborating with UCLA's Division of Rheumatology to utilize an integrative medicine approach for patients with various inflammatory joint and connective tissue diseases. In addition to his clinical activities, Dr. Tor is an associate clinical professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine. Dr. Tor, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. All right, thank you again for the introduction and thank you to the National Arthritis Foundation for the invitation and just the opportunity to speak with you all here this afternoon in Los Angeles and evening perhaps with you, for those of you in here in the East Coast. So um, uh, just as the trailer had mentioned with the Nar National Arthritis Foundation, the power is in your hands. And really part of the goal of this talk is to empower you, to help equip you to um, better take care of yourself when it comes to arthritis and the symptoms that, um, that uh, you may be experiencing. For the purpose of this talk, I have about 45 minutes. And so I wanted to cover a few uh, different topics and I'm hoping to do that with my time with you uh, this evening. So to start, I'd like to review some of the key features of integrative medicine, describe what that is, and then introduce some basic concept of, uh, concepts of East-West medicine, which is our brand of integrative medicine practice here at UCLA Health. Also, I'd like to then discuss 
and helping understand the importance of soft tissue dysfunction, how that's related to arthritis, uh, discuss the role of acupuncture, and then in terms of empowerment, teaching you some acupressure points that you'd be able to apply on yourself to help with some of your symptoms. And then uh, hopefully have some time just for a quick demonstration of acupuncture and then leaving the remaining time for questions and answers. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. In terms of before talking about the features of integrative medicine, I just wanted to share this quote. And so for those of you who are familiar with Western medicine, uh, you may have heard of Sir William Osler. He's considered by many the father of modern Western medicine. And uh, oftentimes when we speak to the medical community or even with patients, we, we start off with one of his quotes because he often captures the essence of good medicine. And his one quote here says, it is much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than what sort of disease the patient has. And so I would ask you, do you ever feel that way when you see your health provider? Do you feel like they're treating the disease and not treating you? Because the reality is not every person with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis of the knee should be treated the same. In fact, you have to be treated as an individual. And so what we're describing here is you have to teach treat the patient with the disease rather than just the disease itself. What this quote is describing is something that we often term as patient-centered care, patient-centered care, where care is customized to the individual. For those of you who are familiar with research, you may have heard this term N equals 100, N equals 1,000, because they do these large studies. But really, when you talk about integrative medicine, patient-centered care, it's N equals 1. How do you treat this person who's in front of me? And the way to do that is you really have to utilize a holistic approach, a holistic approach, which means taking into account the person as a whole. So holistic to me means, well, getting to know the person in terms of what they eat, how they sleep, what kind of exercise they're doing, if they're exercising, what kind of stressors they're going through, how do they manage stress, what makes their pain better, what makes their pain worse. So in other words, you have to get to know the person. And this takes some investment of time uh, to get to know the individual. And this becomes really, really important because it's practical. In order for me to provide practical self-care tips and recommendations, I have to know uh, all those aspects that affect your day-to-day -day life, right? And so in order to teach you how to better uh, make better dietary choices, I need to know what you're eating and what you're not eating and so forth. So we have to use a holistic approach to get to know the person. Uh, integrated medicine utilizes all appropriate therapeutic modalities and you'll see there um, in parentheses, conventional and non-conventional. So conventional is usually what we think of as Western medicine or uh, what we typically find um, in our modern healthcare system. Non-conventional may sometimes be thought of as alternative medicine or complementary medicine or even integrated medicine. And so there's different types. There's a, there's a wide umbrella. Uh, often the buzz term now is integrative medicine. Uh, so that could be for some people practicing homeopathy, naturopathy, chiropractic, Ayurvedic medicine, um, mind-body exercises. There's a whole host of things, but what we practice is East-West medicine, which is combining the best uh, ch traditional Chinese medicine with modern Western medicine. And I think it's important to point out here that any talk on integrated medicine really should not dismiss or discount the value of Western medicine. Western medicine is very, very important and uh, needs to be utilized and maximized for um, all of its benefits, all right? But at the same time, we recognize there are some shortcomings. And because there are some shortcomings, where can potentially integrated medicine or Chinese medicine help to kind of fill in the gaps? Before getting into some of the specifics, other aspects of integrated medicine that are worth pointing out is that it should be stimulating the body's ability to heal itself through self-care. Now, sometimes I just ask this question in general, if you were in an audience, I'd be asking you, do you believe the body can heal itself? Some people don't believe that idea because we're so used to seeing doctors, we're so used to seeing a health provider. But the reality is, you may be thinking back in the past, maybe you had a sprained ankle, right? And you have a swollen red joint, but at the same time, you recognize that within a few days or maybe a week or so, it will like, it'll likely get better on its own. Or maybe you develop some cold symptoms, maybe some sore throat, cough, maybe a little bit of fever. You don't necessarily see your doctor, but you recognize that if you take care of yourself, you rest, then generally your body can help uh, recover. Um, and if it doesn't recover in a timely manner, then that's when you seek the help of your healthcare provider, your primary care doctor, or your specialist, right? But how do you leverage the body's ability to heal? That's why the holistic approach is so important. And we teach patients how to better sleep, 
how to better take care of themselves, how to better eat and so forth. It should emphasize prevention and wellness. And prevention is more than just screening for cancer, like mammograms and colonoscopies, or more than just vaccinations. Prevention is how do you take something like arthritis and prevent it from causing pain or limiting your quality of life? I mean, the reality is there's many people walking around with arthritis who don't even realize it. And the only reason why we recognize you, have, you may have arthritis is because you have pain and the pain causes you to see your doctor. Your doctor does a workup that may include an x-ray or imaging study. And from that x-ray, they realize that uh, you have arthritis in that joint. But the reality is there's many people with arthritis. The, I think there's a, there's a report that was just came out from the CDC saying that 25%, just about 25% of adults suffer from arthritis in the United States. And I think that's an underestimate because those are the ones who are usually seeing their doctors and, uh, and it's being recognized. Um, but at the same time, how do we prevent those people who have early arthritis or even have um, active arthritis, how can we prevent that from causing symptoms? That's, that's what prevention to me means. And then wellness, how do you feel like um, you're, you're feeling well, you're feeling alive? As one of my patients put it, Western medicine kept me alive. Uh, East-West medicine helped me feel like I'm living. There's that different aspect of quality of life that we're trying to maximize, trying to make the most of. And integrated medicine should also be informed by evidence. Okay, we wanna know not only if it's effective or not only how it works, we wanna know, is it safe? And those are the things we need to discuss and we do more studies on. And we're gonna discuss some of those studies uh, hopefully in this talk. Lastly, integrated medicine is varied in its practice. I kind of touched upon that already. The way I practice integrative medicine is, is as I mentioned, East-West medicine. So as we transition to East-West medicine, I wanted to take, a, take time to introduce another quote by Dr. William Osler. And uh, I think this sets the stage for the next um, sort of phase of this discussion. He makes this quote on the statement of disease. Why is a right judgment on this one point, the nature of disease, the aim of medical education and of research? Why is that the be all and end all of our efforts? It's because upon correct knowledge depends the possibility of the control of disease and upon our views of its nature, the measures for its prevention or cure. Simply stated here, Dr. Osler is saying that the way we picture the problem is the way we're going to handle the problem. The way we diagnose the problem is how we're going to Set, is going to set the stage for how we treat and how we hopefully try to cure the problem. In other words, how we solve the problem. Chinese medicine is just another way of looking at the disease, or in this case, looking at the patient with the disease. Okay, so what we're describing here, or at least what Dr. Oster is describing, is perspective. Perspective is so important. Okay, and what I mean by East West medicine is that East West medicine provides me just a different perspective. It, in many ways, provides me, as you see here, the analogy of the flip shades where you have two sets of lenses and I, and I can look through an East, Eastern medicine, Chinese medicine lens or versus a little Western medicine lens. So I can look through both. And why this is so important is because the lens in which I look through helps me filter the information I'm gathering from the patient. And what they're telling me as they're telling maybe three of the other specialists or the primary care doctor, they're telling me, they're telling us all the same story, but it tell, the, the Chinese medicine lens gives me a different way to interpret what they're telling me. It allows me to ask different questions that will hopefully lead maybe to some possible problem solving solutions. And so the lens not only affects the way I, I gather information, but it affects also what I project in terms of my recommendations in terms of how you better take care of yourself or what are suggestions in terms of what therapeutic options you have that can help with your painful joints or your muscle pains and so forth. So perspective is really important. So how does Chinese medicine tend to look at health and disease? Well, I'm gonna start with very basic concept of we call yin yang theory, yin yang theory. And some of you may be familiar with this picture here. And really, what is this picture trying to capture? Well, really, this is not, this is just a snapshot, but really this idea of yin yang uh, in this circle is this idea of balance, right? So the black here is it's considered yin and the white is considered yang. And this is a, a dynamic a relationship in that this is really a moving, uh, I say a moving relationship where the, the circle is continuously moving, it's continuously in motion. But the idea here is there's balance because if you would take a straight line through the center of the circle, any way you draw that straight line through the center, there's gonna be an equal amount of yin and an equal amount of yang. That's the idea of here of balance. And this concept of balance, even though the terms yin and yang may sound foreign, the concept itself is very familiar to us and is very familiar to us even when in Western medicine. So, you know, Chinese medicine 
is really going back thousands of years. So it's very simple in some of its understandings and basic in its concepts, including this idea of balance. So what we're talking about is a spectrum, okay? A spectrum of health and a spectrum of disease, just like there's a spectrum of black to white, hot and cold, day and night, seasons of the year and so forth. We talk about a spectrum of balance. And so balance in Western medicine is something we do all the time. I say we, me, me as a Western practitioner or as a health provider, I'm thinking in balance or yin yang terms all the time. And examples of this would include things like physiologic temperature. When we check your temperature, we're checking your balance, your hot cold balance. When we're checking your pH, um, we're checking your acid base balance. We're checking your nervous system balance. We're thinking about your sympathetic and autonomic nervous system, which balances your stress response. Or when you're in the hospital, they're doing blood tests, they're looking at your electrolytes, they're looking at your oxygen level, your CO2 level, your carbon dioxide level, your thyroid level, your blood pressure. And so what you may notice is when you go to the clinic, or maybe if you've been admitted to the hospital, oftentimes the first thing that's checked are your vital signs. And your vital signs, whether it's your temperature, your heart rate, your, your respiratory rate, and so forth, that really gives us a snapshot of your balance. And if you're having a fever, if you're having high blood pressure, if you're having a low respiratory rate, we have to figure out why and try to troubleshoot that and bring you back into balance. So, so again, in Western medicine, this is not foreign. This is something we're doing all the time. We're doing it every day with every patient. And so and now introducing another concept of East-West medicine, besides yin and yang and balance, there's this concept or term we, we often use as um, qi, qi. And so maybe you heard this term before. And maybe you've heard it translated. Some people translate this as energy. You can see here, it can be translated as vital energy or matter, energy on the verge of materializing. The reality is that not one word completely captures the meaning of qi. And that's the case with any Chinese character. You know, Chinese characters are pictures. Um, and really, as you say, a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, it's, it's a picture, right? And it's just translated qi. The energy on one level, but it's really this idea of reserve the body, the, the body's capacity, resilience, being able to accomplish things, to be able to adapt to certain things. So with that in mind, you know, when we talk about this concept of chi or energy, um, some, some of us may have a hard time getting um, just our minds around, wrapped around this idea of energy running through the body. But in Chinese medicine, there's this thought that if there's no chi, if there's no energy, there's no life. And so what's really important to recognize this in Western medicine is that if you ever did an EKG, you're actually measuring energy the energy potential of one's heart. Or if you do the same thing for the brain, we call that an EEG, you're measuring brain waves, which measure again, electric potential. And we recognize that if those lines go flat and there's no energy, there's no life, okay? So this idea that there's energy running throughout the body and this energy is flowing. And the idea of Chinese medicine is that it's a study of the normal flow and quantities of qi. The normal flow and quantities of qi, okay? that's basically what, uh, what it boils down to, all right? And then when, when there's symptoms, when there's an imbalance, it usually starts with either chi deficiency, a lack of energy, or a low energy state, or an excess. But we don't really call excess chi, we call it chi stagnation, where there's a blockage of this chi, where it's not flowing well, it gets stuck. All right, those are some of the major preconditions to symptoms, including arthritis, including pain, and so forth. We're gonna get into that. First, let's talk about chi deficiency. Qi deficiency, I know it's an unfamiliar term for most of you, uh, but basically most people with qi deficiency may present with fatigue. And so some of you who have arthritis, maybe rheumatoid arthritis, or maybe some type of other connective tissue disease, uh, maybe struggle with chronic fatigue. And some of you maybe are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised, maybe from the medications that are being used to treat the arthritis, or maybe it's because your immune system is so low that you recognize you get recurrent infections. Uh, or you recognize that it takes a long time to recover from an infection, right? It's an indication of your immune response, all right? So those with the low chi uh, state or chi deficiency tend to be immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. They may also have digestive issues or struggle for indigestion like bloating, gas, distension. Many people describe as food, sens food sensitivities where they may eat something and it causes a reaction. They may not have a true food allergy, but for some reason it causes bloating, gas, distension every time they eat it. And that's an indication of a low reserve or a low chi state. Okay, so that's sort of an idea of, of chi deficiency. This picture is a great one because it kind of reminds me, and we're all familiar with like a cell phone, right? Or a laptop. We try to charge it regularly because we don't want it to run low on energy. But 
Uh, we recognize it needs to be charged every uh, so often. And for those of us who have a low capacity, sometimes our phones can be charged at once an hour, right? Or some of us with a laptop can't even take it off the, off the charger because the capacity is so low on it. And we recognize that for our laptop, we need to minimize some of those windows or for our phone, we need to close some of those apps because when a lot of those things are happening at one time, it's too much for the body to handle. And that's because of the low chi state is going to deplete us that much quicker. So for those of the low chi state, we feel like we can't function at optimal capacity. Then there's chi stagnation. You know, chi stagnation, again, is this flow of energy, but it gets blocked. And we're like, well, what does that mean? I mean, what kind of symptoms would a patient come in who has chi stagnation? Well, if we think about this concept of flow, many of us can, can relate to this idea of circulation. We can think of blood flow. So that's pretty intuitive. If we have clots or you have plaques that can get stuck in our arteries, and that can cause heart disease, like heart attacks, and that can cause uh, brain disease, like strokes or dementia. But you have digestive flow issues. Some people may come with, again, bloating, gas, reflux, diarrhea, constipation, digestive issues. Those are flow issues. Or some people may have wheezing or shortness of breath, bronchospasms, airflow issues. Maybe some women with irregular menses or cramping. They have menstrual flow issues. We have urinary flow issues. But the, the, the commonality, whether it's blood flow, digestive flow, menstrual flow, airflow, urinary flow, is that all these organs involve smooth muscle. They involve smooth muscle, all right, that contract and relax, contract and relax. And the thing about it is what impairs the flow is what causes tension within those muscles, okay? And that tension, this is an acupuncture concept, so it's important to realize before you get tension in the smooth muscle of your organs, you actually get tension in your motor muscle or your skeletal muscles, like in your neck, your shoulders, your back. All right. So, so this may not be necessary for the scope of this, but some of you may experience more than just arthritic symptoms. You may have other organ symptoms. So if you come in for any of these symptoms, we would treat uh, the muscles uh, that are tight in your neck, your shoulder, and your back to help with symptoms of your, your lungs or your, your circulation or your menstrual flow. But we also can treat muscle pain, because muscle pain, um, you build up tension, these contracted bands of muscle that form what we call trigger points, trigger points. All right, and trigger points, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but with trigger points is an example of stagnant energy, where the energy is blocked uh, when the muscle gets tight. And this usually is a result of stress, some kind of stress on the system, okay? So when we talk about chi stagnation, we're talking about stress, and the result of stress is the body protects itself, and in doing so, the muscles tighten, okay? You can probably feel this when you're under stress because maybe you get tension headaches, maybe you'll get neck pain, maybe you'll get back pain. But the reality is some people get joint pain. And the, the idea here is that you can experience joint pain and joint stiffness with stress as well. And so the interesting thing about it is I think the majority of you who have arthritis likely see a rheumatologist. My guess is that you see a rheumatologist, but you probably never thought of, well, what is a rheumatologist? You may not realize that rheuma, the root word rheuma from the Greek origin actually means to flow like a river. And so a rheumatologist's goal, if you look back 2000 years ago in the origins of room, rheumatology is meant to reestablish flow. And the picture of, of flow or the picture of health is one who's moving freely, moving freely and, and, and easily, you know, about their daily, daily life. Okay, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish with our patients with arthritis is to help you move freely and move easily. Okay, with those with joint pains and, our, and stiffness and arthritis, that's where the struggle is with pain and limited range of motion. Okay, so that's really the, the goal. Okay, so when we talk about chi stagnation, I touched upon this idea, well, you know, when you have arthritis, when we talk about blockage. You've maybe heard your doctor say, well, if I have osteoarthritis, what they're telling me is I have a very narrow joint. I have very limited joint capacity. There's very little joint space. So oftentimes the bone can rub up on the bone and that can cause spurring. That can cause some degeneration, right? When you have those structural changes, what ends up happening is that there's these muscles that helps us support your joint, whether it's your shoulder joint, your knee joint, your ankle, your hands, these muscles have to work harder to help support your joint. And when muscles work harder, which is a stress on the muscle, it causes them to tighten, causes them to tighten, okay? And so when the muscles start to tighten, there are these small peripheral nerves that run through all our muscles. And the reality is, is that these muscles can put pressure on these smaller peripheral nerves that run through these muscles that can cause things like tingling, numbness, burning, pins and needle sensations, and oftentimes you do a nerve conduction study, 
it will come back as normal because the nerve conduction study is looking at the large nerves that are coming out of the spinal cord, these nerve roots, but they're really not capturing what's going on in the peripheral smaller nerves um, in, the, in the different in their um, outer part portions of the body. And it's oftentimes we have to address the muscle, the soft tissue to get those muscles to relax, to, to de-trigger those trigger points in order to pressure off the nerves to help those nerve symptoms, okay? So it's all about trying to release tension and, and open up a relaxed joints, take pressure off the nerves. That's what's going to help with managing pain, all right? So in order to release the tension, we have to be able to identify the tension. And the only way to identify the tension is you actually have to put your hands on the patient. You actually have to feel for these on those muscles. And what I'm feeling for are trigger points. When I talk about myofascial trigger points, myofascial, myo is muscle, fascia is soft tissue. So muscular soft tissue pain. What is that? Well, basically it happens when one when, when forms what we call trigger points or tight muscle knots within the muscle bellies. It's like muscles like rubber bands. They contract and they relax, they contract and relax. And for whatever reason, the mechanical stress, the repetitive stress on those muscles that causes those muscles to tighten up like a contracted rubber band, right? And that can cause these trigger points. And these trigger points are often very hypersensitive. They're tender when, when, they're, when they're pressed. They often are located in the head, the neck, the shoulders, the lower back. And when pressure is applied, it can mimic or reproduce the pain. And the goal is to get that muscle, that knot, or that trigger point to deactivate by releasing that knot, getting that tension to let go, okay? And that is the goal. These trigger points, again, this is sort of a blow up view of what's happening in within the muscle belly, these contracted muscle fibers. And these can occur in the shoulders, they can occur in the upper back. They can cause referred pain, pattern of pain, and perhaps those who may have associated headaches, you um, recognize this, if you have tight muscles here and you can cause referred pain to the base of your skull called occipital headaches, or we call temporal headaches, right? And so we detrigger these points to help those headaches. And this, for some people to get headaches on the top of their head, we call it a vertex headache. Well, sometimes detriggering a point in your neck or doing acupressure massage in your neck can help with the vertex type headaches. And, and you can develop trigger points again in the upper back, you can, some people have chest pain. It's not from your heart. I mean, it's not from your lungs. They do those studies and they all look okay, but it really is a trigger point from the back that's causing chest pain. Or, you know, you have abdominal pain that's unexplained. Maybe it's a, it's a trigger point in your back that's causing this abdominal pain. Or maybe your hip pain isn't just joint related. Maybe it's trigger points, muscular soft tissue related that's causing your hip pain and your groin pain. So, you know, trigger points can happen in large muscle groups throughout the body. And what's interesting is that trigger points were actually coined and discovered in the 50s. In fact, the, the, the Bible on the trigger points was written in the 50s by Dr. Simons, Dr. Travell. Uh, and Dr. Travell, you may know, recognize the name Dr. Janet Travell. She was actually the first female physician, uh, personal physician to the president. And you guys remember JFK, right? JFK, he was, he was famous for sitting in his rocking chair. And the reason, the story behind that is because he, did, he experienced and dealt with chronic low back pain. And he uh, struggled finding a solution for his chronic low back pain until he met Dr. Janet Trebell, who did trigger point injections and helped solve the problem with uh, his chronic low back pain. And because of that, uh, she was invited to be his personal physician. And that's sort of the story of trigger points. Those were discovered in the 1950s. Acupuncture points were discovered about 2,000 years ago, uh, some say 3,000 years ago. But the idea here is that there is a study done by Dr. Melzak and his colleagues, and they published this in the Journal of Pain in 1977, and he found there's actually a correlation between acupuncture points and trigger points. He found a 71% correlation. In fact, there was a newer study done in 2001, 2002, and actually found an over 90% correlation between acupoints and trigger points. And so acupuncture points were discovered independently with trigger points, but they found them to be an overlap. So acupuncture points, just so you have a, an, an idea what those are, again, were discovered thousands of years ago. They found the idea is that there's uh, chi or energy that flows within these pathways of energy called meridians that uh, go throughout the body. And basically it's kind of going from point A to point B and back again, flowing throughout the body. And the energy gets stuck or it tends to concentrate in certain areas. And the acupuncture needle goes into these certain points to unblock or open up that area to help the, help the energy uh, flow smoothly again. Okay, so that's the idea of acupuncture. It's like, uh, I'm in LA. I don't know if you guys are in major cities, but you guys are familiar with freeway systems. It's kind of like the idea when you, when you get to an interchange, for, for us, it's like the 405 freeway and the 10, the 405 freeway and the 101. It's like we know that we're going to have to put our, our, our foot over the brake because we're going to have to brake soon. It's like we know that it's going to get congested. It's going to get backed up there, right? 
And the idea there uh, with Caltrans, who basically takes our tax dollars and tries to open up the freeways, tries to make things smoother for traffic, it's like they know where to go with that money to open up the freeways because they know where the stagnation tends to be. Well, in acupuncture, it's the same way as an acupuncturist. You know where the stagnation tends to be by feeling where these points are, appreciating the tension, uh, these trigger points, and you're going in with the needle to open things up. That's really what an acupuncturist, in essence, is, is trying to do, right, in, in, to reestablish flow. So the question then becomes, does acupuncture really work, right? I mean, what is it doing and how does it work? So there's lots of studies being done on this and, I, and the scope of this talk is really to talk about all about acupuncture, but I just wanna share a few studies with you. I just wanted to mention there's this uh, study we call a meta-analysis on acupuncture for chronic pain. And a meta-analysis just means it's a review of all the latest and up-to-date evidence that's considered good. Okay, so they, they looked at four I mean, the quality is considered good, the quality of the study. So they looked at four chronic pain conditions and they, they identified back and neck pain, osteoarthritis, chronic headache, and shoulder pain. And they did it, they looked at about 29 trials and over eight, about 18,000 patients they analyzed. And they found that acupuncture was superior to both sham and no acupuncture control for each pain condition. In other words, they found true acupuncture to be effective. And the, these, the conclusion from these authors was significant differences between true and sham acupuncture, which is fake acupuncture, indicate that acupuncture is more than just the placebo. And this was a study that was published in a reputable journal in 2012, Archives of Internal Medicine. There's another study looking at osteoarthritis of the hip or the knee. This was a study done in 2006. And uh, so this is, this is about 15 years old, and there's a lot more studies that actually confirm these findings. But this study that was done was to investigate the effectiveness of acupuncture in addition to routine care compared to those who just received routine care alone. And they found that in the treatment of these patients with chronic pain due to arthritis, osteoarthritis of the knee and the hip, uh, they, they investigated acupuncture um, over a three month period. And about 3,600 3, patients, and they found that these results that they found indicate that acupuncture plus routine care is associated with marked clinical improvement in patients with chronic osteoarthritis associated pain of the knee or the hip. This is very interesting and this is very important because now a lot of insurance companies that do cover acupuncture cover only for specific indications. And oftentimes for those that do cover it, it's for things like osteoarthritis of the knee and osteoarthritis of the hip because of studies like these. So another study that was done on rheumatoid arthritis. This was actually another systemic review. Again, a review of all the existing literature that was considered good quality evidence up to that point in time. This is 2018. Uh, they looked at acupuncture, the efficacy of acupuncture on rheumatoid arthritis patients and um, tried to discuss some proposed mechanisms of how it works. They looked at 43 studies and their review, they concluded that acupuncture alone or combined with other treatment modalities is beneficial to the clinical conditions of rheumatoid arthritis without adverse effects and can improve function and quality of life and is worth trying. And they proposed some certain mechanisms like anti-inflammatory effect, an antioxidant effect, and also the regulation of the immune system. And so this gets into, well, how is acupuncture working? Why is it producing these results, including pain, pain relief? Well, some proposed mechanisms are here, right? And these studies are ongoing, but the idea here is there's something called endorphin release. And endorphins are basically your body's own pain uh, sort of neurotransmitters, where your body releases when you're experiencing pain. Um, it, it basically, uh, uh, when you experience this, you have a little euphoria. Oftentimes when you exercise, your body releases endorphins. And so this can give you an analgesic or pain relieving effect. And the interesting thing about this is they also studied when they gave patients something called naloxone, which is a medicine that blocks the effect of opioids, that it negated the effect of the acupuncture in these patients who have pain relief. So there's something physiologic going on with endorphin release um, with acupuncture uh, needle stimulation for, uh, for pain. They're also doing functional MRIs, which is basically doing an MRI real time on a patient, often of the brain when they're receiving acupuncture, All right? And they're saying what's going on in the brain during the time of stimulating certain points of acupuncture. They see that certain parts of the brain are being uh, activated. Uh, the, the connective tissue, uh, what that means is that there's different connective tissues that connect our bones, our joints. Um, we consider these muscles, ligaments, uh, tendons. And the idea is that there's certain mechanical forces at play that when you stimulate those certain areas, those junctions or attachments, 
it, it causes a change in signaling to the brain and can also uh, intervene or affect the inflammatory pathway. In other words, tone down inflammation. And the other thing that's interesting with proposed mechanisms is people have taken local ultrasound. We did an ultrasound over the area that's being, um, acupuncture is being performed and they found that the muscles in that area actually relax where the, knot, the knots in those muscles actually let go and they actually see, they actually see improved circulation to that area uh, through ultrasound. All right, so it's, it's relaxing the muscle and it's also promoting blood flow to, the, to that area that's being stimulated with the acupuncture needles. So uh, this is just a quick mention, a functional MRI study looking at the brain. Uh, they just found that there's a point and I'm gonna show you for stress on the hand that when they did acupuncture here, they looked at their brain and they found that a consistent area that was being lit up here is the limbic system, which is important for, it's a regulatory center for stress and emotions. So that there's a, a real relationship between a point often used for stress um, that's going, that is having certain activity of the brain that regulates our stress and our emotional controls. Um, so that's just something I would mention as a mechanism. I wanna make sure I leave time for, for questions and answers at the end. So I just wanna show that the NIH made a consensus statement in 1998. So over 20 years ago, they recognized the acupuncture as an, is a recommend as an adjunct treatment for headaches, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain, and osteoarthritis, as well as low back pain and tennis elbow. The WHO also made a statement and their statement was much broader, but they also did include things like sciatica, low back pain, osteoarthritis, and frozen shoulder. The treatment of myofascial pain, I sort of touched upon earlier. There's things like acupuncture, trigger point injections, there's manual massage therapy, self-acupressure, which is what we teach patients, and I can teach you a little bit today. There's electrostimulation through electroacupuncture or use of a TENS unit, uh, ultrasound therapy, heat therapy, topical ointments like menthol, Bengay, Tiger Balm, Biofreeze, and something called cupping, uh, which promotes blood flow to that area. We can't underemphasize the importance of stress management because that's um, often what drives the tension or the contraction of the joint. And then muscle exercises, which encourage the muscles to relax, such as stretching, addressing posture, ergonomics, and avoiding overloading or repetitive strain. So there's these five essential points that I wanted to mention um, that you can use and apply maybe on yourself or on your friends or loved ones. Um, I just wanted to mention this first point here. We have five of these, but the first one's often used for stress. It's located on the hand. Now I should mention that this is a powerful point that we use in the setting of pregnancy to help induce labor. For any woman that you feel may be pregnant in the early stages of pregnancy, you'd want to avoid stimulating this point. But otherwise, it's safe to apply pressure. And how you find it, it's, it's the point uh, between um, when you put your thumb and your index finger together, there's a muscle that bulges up and you apply pressure with your opposite thumb right in, right in here. And this helps to uh, things like stress, headaches, toothaches, facial pain, neck pain, cold symptoms, all right? And I know that all of us at some point suffer with some of these, uh, but stress is the important aspect I wanted to highlight here. And all these points I'm showing you are on both sides. So you can apply acupressure to both hands. You may feel a little aching sensation in terms of how long you apply pressure. I usually say maybe 30 seconds, a minute, twice a day, but you can do it even if it's for five seconds or 10 seconds at a time while you're waiting at a stoplight or you're waiting at the grocery store in line. The next point is also, uh, it's next to the hand, but it's on the wrist. It's actually three fingers below the wrist crease in between those tendons that you'll see when you flex your hand, your wrist. Together, you apply pressure with your thumb. Now, this point is also important for anxiety or stress, but it's also used for nausea. And so people experience nausea from their medications, perhaps for arthritis, um, motion sickness, carpal tunnel, upset stomach. Um, again, this is important for um, any chest pain as well. So I think of this as important for stress and anxiety. Um, but also something, any pain in the chest area can be helpful. The next point is on the foot. It's on the foot. And you'll see it there in the picture. It's two fingers. I won't be able to take my shoe, my foot out of my sock and shoe and show you this, but you can just imagine there's two fingers here. You go two fingers uh, width above the web space in between the bones to your great toe and to your, your second toe. And you apply pressure with your foot, with your thumb. And this point here tends to be pretty sensitive. And it's good for stress. Again, it's good for insomnia, for those who struggle with sleep. Um, it's good for low back pain. And it's also good for limb pain, specifically leg pain. So this is a point we often use in the clinic as well. The fourth point is uh, 
located above the ankle bone. Now this too, just like the first point, can induce labor as well. So you wanna avoid it in those who are pregnant. Um, uh, and this is good for women's health issues. We call it the women's point because it's good for menstrual cramping, it's good for pelvic pain, um, re menstrual regularities, but it's also great for sleep. It's often important to use for men as well. I mentioned sleep, um, perhaps to talk for another time about how sleep deprivation or poor sleep quality leads to inflammation. So we have to improve the quality of sleep in order to help tone down the inflammation in the body. The last point, stomach 36. You don't have to remember the names of these, but just the, where it's located and how it can help. This is located four fingers uh, below the bottom of the kneecap. So it's four fingers below the bottom of the kneecap. And then it's one thumb width right outside the bone here. In fact, there's a muscle. If you put your thumb there and if you flex your toes up towards your head, you're gonna feel a muscle bulge out. That's where this point is located. And this point is great for knee pain. This is uh, one of those points studied when I talked about osteoarthritis of the knee. This is a great point for knee pain, fatigue, so for cheat deficiency or like foggy brain or you know uh, poor concentration, this is a great point. And also for any type of GI discomfort, digestive issue. I wanted to address some common questions and then leave the rest of the time for questions from the audience. Um, I just wanted to mention some common questions that are often asked from, from me in the clinic or asked by uh, those in the audience are, you know, how many acupuncture sessions does it take to finally see results? And I usually tell patients that it may take four to six treatments, but the reality is each person is different. It often depends on the severity of one's condition or the severity of one's pain and the chronicity of one's pain. It's different for someone who's experiencing it for four weeks versus four months or even four years. And usually I say four to six treatments uh, to notice a difference, if not sooner, it may not, be, may not mean resolution, but it mean an appreciable difference where this is helping. You, you usually notice by four to six treatments, but the biggest variable in patients improving is not just the treatment, it's the self-care. The self-care that's taught and the self-care that's applied between treatments. I look at the treatment as just hitting the reset button, getting the muscles to relax, getting the joints to expand, getting the circulation to improve. The self-care is to help maintain that, right? And if you maintain that pattern, then the result of that pattern will continue to follow and that would be pain relief. Next question is, does everyone see results? And I wish I could say everyone sees results, but I would say that uh, many people see results and that results in terms of improvement. Um, but again, it's dependent upon how well one is able to help take care of themselves. That I think is a major sort of contributing factor to the outcome. And how many sessions, I sorry, I mentioned four to six sessions. Um, you should notice a difference by then, if not hopefully sooner. And how, how long does pain relief typically last? It can last anywhere from, some people notice a diff, don't notice a difference right away after one treatment. It may take a series of treatments, but once they notice a benefit, often it can last hours to days to even weeks. And we have patients then who spread out their appointments accordingly, whether it's once a week, to twice, once every other week, to once a month, and maybe do a maintenance once a month, or just at that, that point come in as needed. Um, how long does pain relief typically last? I sort of mentioned that typical session, length and duration. It depends where you go. Uh, in our clinic, most patients, uh, we set aside an hour for them to be in the room. Uh, they get often multiple treatments, including acupuncture, where they may relax with the needles for like 20 minutes at a time, where they may get a uh, manual massage therapy session that lasts eight to 10 minutes, or maybe they get cupping that lasts eight to 10 minutes. We're going to get trigger point injections, which generally just take a few minutes or so once we identify the points. But a typical session in our clinic would last an hour. I would imagine the community um, if you get acupuncture, it could last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour as well. What can I expect during an appointment? I would think the biggest thing you would expect is that someone would get to know you as a person and hopefully can explain to you how they picture your problem and how from what they picture your problem, how their therapeutic recommendations um, make sense and were worthwhile. And beyond that, how to better te uh, teach you how to take care of yourself. I would hope that would be what you get out of an appointment um, when, you, when you come in. At least that would be the goal that I have. Uh, when patients come in. Um, how to find a reputable acupuncturist. Uh, this is a challenge. I think each state has their own medical board for acupuncture, including California. I uh, usually, if I don't have a personal recommendation, I would say, look up that person's name that you find on the medical acupuncture board website, make sure that they have a license that's in good standing. And then there's a lot of information probably online and probably a lot of reviews that may be helpful, but you may be worth giving them a call before you see them in person. Hopefully you can get them on the line and maybe they'd be able to explain over the phone um, how they could be of help to you. Maybe that would be um, helpful before you actually meet them in person. Does insurance cover this? Well, actually starting in 2000, Medicare covers acupuncture, but only for one indication. And that one indication is chronic low back pain. 
and that's, off, and that's largely because of those studies I mentioned. So chronic low back pain is the only indication acupuncture is covered uh, and Medicare covers that for 90, for 12 visits for a 90 day period. 12 days, 12 visits for a 90 day period, Medicare covers acupuncture for chronic low back pain. Outside of that, it depends on your insurance. And more and more insurances are covering acupuncture, but for specific indications like arthritis of the hip, arthritis of the knee. And how can I talk to my doctor about trying acupuncture, Chinese medicine, integrated medicine? I would say, just be very open and very frank. Uh, just share what your philosophy is about your own health. And so hopefully that way you will find someone who will be willing to partner with you and really look at it as a partnership rather than them telling you what to do. Um, uh, hopefully you find someone who's comfortable and they can direct you to the proper resources so you can find uh, someone who can offer these services that you're looking for. Okay, I try my best to stay on time. I apologize if I talk too quickly, um, but I'm here and available, ready to answer any of your questions that you may have. Dr. Tara, thank you for your time and for such an enlightening presentation. We're going to open up the floor for some questions now. Please keep in mind that we've received many questions both before and during the webinar. So we're gonna do our best to address everyone's questions, but we're gonna answer the most common ones first. So let's get started. Our first question is, is it safe to combine Eastern, excuse me, is it safe to combine Eastern medicine treatments like acupuncture with medications like methotrexate or biologic drugs? Can these practices interfere with the effectiveness of these types of arthritis medications? It's a great question. I think acupuncture generally uh, is very safe and can be safely um, use, we use it all the time with patients who are on biologics or on immunosuppressants, uh, things like methotrexate, um, uh, those type of common medications for those suffering with arthritis, uh, anti-inflammatories, narcotics. We can use these, we can still do acupuncture safely. Uh, we can do massage safely. We can do cupping safely. The only contraindication in cupping is for those who are on blood thinners. Uh, you have to be careful of those who are on blood thinners and using things like Eliquis or things like Coumadin or warfarin. If someone's on aspirin, it's still okay. If someone's taking like meloxicam, it should be okay. But um, other blood thinners, uh, those I would be careful with. When it comes to herbal medicine, it's a different story. Herbal medicine hasn't been well studied, especially for these newer medications that are coming onto the market. So there's potential herb and drug interactions that we may not be aware of. So I tend to shy away from herbal medicine, especially in patients who are taking those types of medications. Um, I, instead, I try to use my Chinese nutrition, try to use food as dietary herbs that follow the same principles can be effective without the concern for toxicity or side effects. And the second question is, are there any similarities between acupuncture and dry needling? And what about acupressure and EFT, a type of tapping? Yes, so acupuncture is a form of dry needling. Uh, and there's no medicine or nothing being injected while you're doing acupuncture. And um, oftentimes we do acupuncture, we do some type of uh, manipulation of the needle where um, we try to stimulate the point as a sort of form of dry needling. Um, in terms of acupressure and EFT, emotional freedom technique. Uh, emotional freedom technique utilizes this concept of acupressure points. Uh, I think it depends on the practitioner because I don't know if they're knowledgeable about true acupressure points, but they're doing tapping as opposed to pressure. So to me, it's really not true stimulation of the point. Um, I see EFT more as a mind-body exercise uh, trying to help as a stressful technique to manage stress. But in, if it comes to stimulation of a point, I would prefer them to do acupressure where they actually apply pressure and massage the point to effectively stimulate it as opposed to tapping. And can acupuncture or acupressure slow the progression of joint damage? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, I think in joint damage, the only way to really know objectively is you'd have to repeat x-rays. So for example, you have a baseline x-ray which shows moderate, um, like mild, moderate, severe arthritis at one point in time, and you'd have to do acupuncture over a certain period of time, and then do another repeat imaging study to really know, but there's so many, it's hard to do as a study. The reality is, and clinically, in real world, uh, most of us who are following uh, blood tests, we're also following symptoms. And most of those studies that I've, I've noted are following symptoms in terms of decreased pain scale, increased quality of life in terms of range of motion, um, activities, how many steps they can walk, uh, and so forth. So um, I don't have any good evidence to say it's going to stop the progression of arthritis because it's often not done in the real world, real world setting. We're usually following symptoms to, to measure improvement. Okay, 
you, Kelly. And uh, we've had a question come in that says, if I get a steroid injection, can I still get acupuncture? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? What kind of injection? A steroid. If, if I get a steroid injection, can I still get acupuncture? Yes. Right. Yes, you still can. It's not a contraindication. A lot of our patients have, and we can do it concurrently. Um, oftentimes, you know, when you do multiple modalities, the reality is we don't really, it's hard sometimes to know what is doing what, but if the goal is to try to get patient as better as soon as possible, uh, we, the answer to the question is yes, we can do both concurrently. Um, that's not a contraindication to get the acupuncture. Great, thank you. What questions should I, as a patient, ask a potential acupuncturist to determine if they're knowledgeable and if they're skilled with working with arthritis patients? Yeah, I think you'd ask them just that. I'd ask them how comfortable and experienced are you working with patients with arthritis or patients in chronic pain? Um, they would be able to give you a reflection of what the majority of their practice is. Some people are, are uh, really um, specialists and in, in, in their, their niche is chronic pain for others and maybe women's health or maybe for cancer patients um, uh, and so forth. So I, I would just ask them uh, their, their uh, level of comfort and experience in treating those with chronic pain um, and then what techniques they utilize. So not all acupuncturists just do acupuncture. Some do cupping, some do massage, some do um, herbal medicine, right? And, and some do uh, relaxation techniques um, uh, and so forth. So I think the, the question would be your experience, your level of comfort, um, what modalities you offer. And then based upon that, the level of comfort you feel with their communication, like how well can they express or articulate what it is that they're gonna to try to do with you? Because language can sometimes be a barrier. So um, I had a question about when you would stop treating someone with acupuncture. So for example, if you, had someone who was not showing any improvement through acupuncture, how many sessions would you have before you made that decision to stop? Yeah, um, it's, it's a great and common question. I would say that, you know, I don't want to leave it open-ended where we just do this forever and, right. and the patients aren't getting better that they think, when will this ever end? When am I going to see a difference? I usually tell them the expectation is a series of treatments, probably four or six treatments that you would hopefully notice the difference by then, if not sooner. And again, I just emphasize the importance and the value of the self-care. That to me is the biggest difference because even if you see an acupuncturist, even if you get trigger point injections, even if you get massage, that can help at that point in time, but it may not help change the pattern that led to this point. What led to this point is the self, is we have to dress through the self-care. And if you can do the self-care effectively and consistently, then that's something that will change the pattern, which will hopefully allow you more sustained pain relief. And hopefully then at some point, be able to spread out the appointment. But if you don't notice the difference by four to six treatments, I usually say by then that's probably an adequate trial and it may not be helpful for you. Okay, that's uh, really good to know. Do you have any views on trigger point injections for fibromyalgia knots? And how often is it standard to get them? Yeah, I think um, in a classic Western medicine textbook, trigger point injections is a common treatment for treatment modality for fibromyalgia. So um, how often, that's a good question. I, I think it depends on the practitioner. The way UCLA Health is, we are, our clinic is recognized by delivering, offering trigger point injections. And so in our clinic, we can offer patients uh, perhaps trigger point injections once a week, once every other week. It's safe to do because we use no steroids in our injections. We just use a little bit of lidocaine, like one or two drops at each point. That's all we use. We don't use any other medicines. And so um, it depends on the practitioner. Maybe if you see a rheumatologist, maybe they'd offer once a month maybe once every three months, maybe the same is true with pain management doctor. They maybe offer once a month, once every three months. So it depends on their style of practice, but it can be safely done. Um, even our clinic once a week, as long as you're using, as long as like you're not using steroids because steroids would be a limiting factor in how often you could receive them. All right. Um, so we've had a question come in about cupping. And uh, so the question says, do you have any views on cupping for arthritis, pain and management? Uh, the person asking the question says, two months ago, cupping was performed on my lower back for chronic pain and it actually increased my pain. I had to ice and use topical creams for four to five days. Would acupuncture be any different? Yeah, so cupping can be helpful for pain. Cupping simply is called cupping because you're using cups. Cups where you create suction 
place it on large muscles or large portions of the body, including the neck, the shoulders, the upper, middle, or lower back, the buttocks, or the, or the thighs. Um, and um, it can be effective because it's basically meant to draw blood or circulation to the area. And that's why you can leave a little bit of light bruising, a little bit of light red marks on, uh, on the area. But that's what's needed for healing, right? Circulation is needed for healing. Uh, that's the same with the sprained ankle, for example. And that's what we need for pain relief. Um, now, there's such a thing as overstimulation, whether it's cupping or whether it's massage, whether it's acupuncture, whether it's electro stimulation with acupuncture, um, doing injections. And, and that overstimulation is usually indicated by, by soreness afterwards, right? And so this is why it's really important to see a practitioner who, do, who does have experience in those with chronic pain. Uh, because you're trying to find the right balance between the amount of stimulation and comfort. Generally, the more stimulating you provide, the more therapeutic benefit potentially it can offer, but the more potential for soreness. So the feedback from the patient becomes really important. They would tell you, oh yeah, that was too much last time. I was really sore for two, three or four days. That would be important then for the practitioner to modify and adjust the amount of stimulation to still get a therapeutic benefit, but without causing soreness. And so we offer cupping, and if that patient had, if that patient came to us and had pain, we would offer maybe a different modality like acupuncture, but keeping in mind that they may be more sensitive and not do as much stimulation with the acupuncture needles. So there, in other words, there are different ways to stimulate these areas, um, and what that tells me is that the overstimulation, when in this situation with the cupping, is something that needs to be um, addressed in the future treatments um, to prevent that from happening. Okay. Okay, so another person asks, I have moderate to severe osteoarthritis in my ankles and feet. The pain is worse after I go to bed at night. Would acupuncture help? And is there a pressure point that I could do myself? Yes, um, I think acupuncture can help for the reasons I mentioned in terms of relaxation, circulation, improving blood flow. I think What's oftentimes that patients with arthritis tend to have most pain at night and in the morning, and it's usually the coldest times of the day. It's really important for arthritis patients is that you need to keep these areas warm, including your feet and your ankles. Um, as you can know, as I mentioned earlier, arthritis is an indication you have narrow joint space. Anything that's going to decrease that functional joint space, which is cold, cold causes contraction of the joint, decreases that functional joint space, so you're going to have more stiffness. Heat, on the other hand, helps to expand that joint space, gives you more functional room and less stiffness. So I would try to soak your feet maybe in warm water beforehand, or maybe if you want to put like a topical like capsaicin, capsaicin is red chili pepper. Um, you can put it topically as long as it doesn't burn your skin. Put on a little area first. If it doesn't, then put it on the, on the larger area and see if it keeps your feet warm, your ankles warm. And then maybe that by keeping it warmer, it's going to promote circulation to those areas when you're sleeping at night. Uh, just be careful with capsaicin when you apply it. You may want to use a glove, but if you use your fingers, you don't want to wash your fingers, so you don't actually rub your eye. So just a disclaimer. And then I think the other thing is, yes, there is acupressure points. In fact, if you just go and massage around your ankle, there's probably some tender points. And the tendency is we don't touch it because it's too sensitive, but the reality is we need to touch it. We need to stimulate it to promote circulation. And over time, as you stimulate it more, it will become less sensitive, okay? So I would encourage you to stimulate it, maybe soak your feet in warm water, maybe try some topical capsaicin, but keep your feet warm. And then hopefully that will have less pain, you'll sleep better. So if my insurance doesn't cover acupuncture, is it possible to get the same types of effects with certain kinds of massages, like deep tissue massage? And do certain types of massages have similar benefits? Yeah, you know, because I, I think what I, what I hope to highlight for the talk is that acupuncture is a concept. Acupuncture is just one way to stimulate a point. In this case, it's with the needle. You can stimulate the same points through manual massage therapy, through cupping, through heat, through topical application, through trigger point injections, there are different ways to stimulate points. So if acupuncture isn't covered, you may want to explore other ways to stimulate these points, including massage, for example, and give that a try. And um, you might try to utilize what your insurance covers to stimulate these points. And at a minimum, try to stimulate these points on your own at home. And hopefully that way you can at least provide yourself some pain relief in the meantime. But I would, I would try to explore it, even though it's not covered acupuncture, these other ways to stimulate those points can be helpful. While we're talking about massage, uh, I've had a question that says, is acupressure the same as um, shiatsu massage? I visited a Japanese acupuncturist once who combined the needles with shiatsu. Yeah, uh, shiatsu, to, to me, my understanding is the form of massage. 
Now there are different types of massage therapies, shiatsu, Swedish trigger point therapy, Feldenkrais. There's different types of massage, different frameworks in terms of thinking. The important thing is the practitioner knows where to put their hands. And then they know, they know where to put their hands because they felt a lot of different bodies. And those who felt a lot of different bodies know where the tension tends to go. So any way in which you can stimulate these points in a way that's comfortable can be therapeutically, can potentially be therapeutically beneficial. So, uh, so shiatsu could be helpful. Now, now the balance of it is, is some of these forms of massage therapy are a little more deeper and therefore a little more stimulating. And so therefore a little more potential for soreness. So again, it's a balance because some people can't handle the deep stimulation. So it's again, per person dependent, patient dependent. Um, but the idea there is that, um, is that uh, more important than the form of massage therapy, it's stimulating the right points with the right amount of pressure. Okay. So do we need to distinguish between osteoarthritic pain versus rheumatoid pain when visiting an acupuncture practitioner? Yes, I think it's important. I mean, to me, it would be important. Um, the reason I say that is because not all arthritis is the same. Not even all, are, not even all osteoarthritis is the same, at least in my opinion, because it's the person and it affects them in different ways. And there are different things that led to that point and how with developing arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, in my experience, is a lot of patients notice, and the same with osteoarthritis, is a lot of patients notice that their pain gets worse when it's cold, when it's raining, and when it's damp. Some arthritis gets worse in the summertime. And that's usually like psoriatic arthritis or lupus arthritis. There's different types of arthritis, and that's why the type of arthritis and how your pain is affected by certain environmental weather conditions will affect your management. So uh, that is just one example. But I mean, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Um, I would say is it's as different as there are different people. That's the way I look at it. You can't treat them like a textbook, but a lot of the things that help one person may help someone else, but you, ne you can't necessarily treat them all the same. And are there any ways to maximize the effectiveness of acupuncture before or after the appointment? Any do's or don'ts for people? Well, I would say in terms of do, I would say beforehand, not much comes to mind other than try to not rush into your appointment. You want to try to come in relaxed. I think, I think there is some value in you being able to relax with, with the needles or before your treatment is more conducive to a healing response. Um, I would generally say most people, most acupuncture would say try to avoid eating, especially a large meal right before you get a treatment done because that's going to direct or uh, sort of divert some of the circulation and the blood flow instead of promoting healing is going towards digestion. In terms of afterwards, I would say, just be careful to try to avoid anything that's too physically vigorous or demanding because that's gonna kind of reinforce or bring back some of the tension and may offset some of the benefits of the treatment. So I'd probably avoid strenuous physical activity till at least the next day. But, but in general, there really isn't any contraindications or limitations as to what you can do afterwards. You can pretty much do your daily activities or whatever else you have. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions come in specifically about acupressure points. And uh, they're asking about acupressure points specifically for hip pain, but also for brain fog. Can you suggest any? Well, first for brain fog, because you can, you can see my face. You can't really see my hip right now. But I would say for, for, uh, for, for brain fog, there's some points along the face. There's points like actually you can't see it right behind my ear. And sometimes you have your ear loop from your face mask will be right there, but it's like right here, um, right behind the angle of your jaw underneath the earlobe, but you can press these pair of points and open and close your mouth at the same time. It kind of helps to bring energy to your head. It's a resuscitation point. Another point is actually right underneath the, the lip and right between the upper lip and the, um, uh, the tip of the nose. But probably the most important point of all these is number one would be the temples right in here. And then also right in the vertex, whereas at the top of your ears come up and if they're imaginary line connecting the top of your ears, right, the, the crown of the head, the vertex, we call it right in here. There's a series um, or a set of points that we have acupuncture to help bring energy to enlighten the, the, the mind, uh, as, as what it's called, um, to stimulate right in this area on um, the vertex. In terms of your hip, there's so many local points that can help the hip because there's so many 
muscles involved for its full range of motion. I would just say take like a tennis ball or maybe take like a roller, a, like a handheld roller, like a lot of runners use, right? And you would go and massage along the front of your, your, your hip, the hip flexor muscles along the groin or along the side, along your IT band, okay? And then, or even along the backside of your hip, uh, the buttock area, the glutes. You can easily do this with the tennis ball too, like in circular motions in the front side and back of your hip or up and down, you know, along the muscles too. So instead of certain points, I would just say, try to hit a region of uh, these different muscle groups with using a ball or a roller. You'll see sometimes people can handle these massage guns. You see athletes use this, um, maybe some basketball players when they're sitting on the bench or baseball players even now during the playoffs. They're using these massage guns. You can use that percuss and you can use to massage the hip muscles, the deeper muscles. Again, as long as you can handle the stimulation, um, that's something you may want to consider using. Okay, so uh, can acupuncture uh, or acupressure ever cause more pain and stiffness? Acupuncture, acupressure cause more pain? Yeah, and that goes back to that question of sometimes it causes overstimulation, right? Overstimulation, too much, too soon, um, the body is not ready for it, can result in soreness, and that can happen. So there's a balance. In this concept of balance, it's important even in this question as well, there's a balance between the amount of stimulation um, and providing relief without overstimulating and causing soreness. Another question about massage. What type of massage works best for someone with fibromyalgia? Uh, that's a great question. You know, there's fibromyalgia patients had different presentations. I would say in general, a lot of fibromyalgia patients are very sensitive to stimulation. So usually I start with less is more. Usually I start low and go slow. Um, so basically light pressure, increased pressure, and then deeper pressure, right? Really important for those with fibromyalgia. Uh, because they tend to be more sensitive than those without fibromyalgia. And that's why the emphasis is often on self-massage because the, the patient can control the amount of pressure that they can apply. And as they apply a little bit more, they can go deeper and deeper. And then over time, that allows us as practitioners to go deeper as well. Okay, so we have our last question for this evening. Oh, one minute. Oh, no, we might have a couple more. So, okay, so our next question is, my rheumatologist doesn't think my shoulder pain both sides come from my autoimmunity, mixed connective tissue disease. And my orthopedist can't figure out what's causing the pain either. I've had steroid injections both front and back in both shoulder joints now and deep medical massage for se several months, but progress is slow. Any suggestions? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the whole story, but basically, uh, say shoulder pain, tried some steroid injections. Um, what else has tried? Physical therapy? Uh. So we've had steroid injections, front and back in both shoulder joints and deep medical massage. massage. Yeah, and they don't think it's from mixed connective tissue disease. <laughs> Yeah, that's a hard question to answer, especially I can't evaluate you in person and I don't know your whole medical history. If it's not responding to a steroid injection, that would suggest it's not an inflammatory joint issue, um, at least not for the shoulder. And uh, the, 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 the deep massage, if that's not working, that doesn't necessarily mean there's not a soft tissue component. It may mean that there's either not a soft tissue component or the stimulation to the area wasn't appropriate. Because sometimes it may take more than just one session of deep tissue for it to, to work. Um, you know, it's hard to say, I think of either a rheumatologist or a sports medicine doctor, uh, you can see, I'm assuming they image the area uh, to make sure there's nothing else structural going on. And you think about either, if you have nerve-like symptoms, you may have to see a neurologist, make sure there's no nerve damage or nerve involvement. So all that to say, if those things check out okay, you may wanna try acupuncture. Um, you know, you, you may wanna try that in combination with physical therapy. Uh, because usually if you get chronic shoulder pain with that's unaddressed, it, will, it can develop the frozen shoulder because you protect it and you don't move it and then you get limited range of motion and then that gets even harder for it to, to improve. So you wanna to try to mobilize it through some physical therapy and you wanna stimulate it either through acupuncture, trigger point injection or something along that sort uh, to help promote circulation, and relax the area. Um, and hopefully the combination of those two will make a difference. And what would you recommend for C5, C6 pinched nerve pain radiating down the arm? 
Well, if it's identified as C5, C6, usually the typical thing is you would see a pain management doctor and they would consider doing a nerve block or doing a, an epidural that targets that level. Now, if you're not interested in that or you tried that and it didn't work, then you would consider things like acupuncture and physical therapy where you trigger point and do some trigger point injections. We look at the nerve, but you probably have coexisting soft tissue pain. And that's often the hardest question to answer is how much is someone's pain related to the joint? How much of their pain is related to soft tissue? Right, the point if it's arthritic point pain or in the spine or the joint, that stuff that's something we can't reverse. But what we can modify, what we can reverse is the soft tissue disease, soft soft tissue tension. We can re release those through acupuncture, sugar point injections, and massage. So I would say those try those things: physical therapy, ac um, trigger point or acupoint stimulation. Um, if those things don't work, then you may want to consider if you haven't tried either a targeted therapy with a steroid injection, uh, an epidural, something like that with a pain management doctor. Okay, so we're on to our final question, and that's, can acupuncture help all types of joint pain, or is it better for specific types? Well, again, we're getting into a, a situation where we're, we're trying to pigeonhole symptoms. They're not treating a patient with the symptoms. I'm trying to stay away from that. I just say, in general, it can help arthritis. And so the thing is, there's not studies looking at arthritis of each finger or arthritis of the elbow and arthritis of the shoulder. There's not studies done on that. There's done studies on OA of the hip and OA of the knee, OA of the hand that has been done because those are the most common areas. And so it can be extrapolated into saying that if it can benefit those areas, then the line of thinking is, well, it should be able to help other joints affected by arthritis. I can't say that with any evidence because it hasn't really been, been, been studied per se uh, in large studies, but I think the potential for its value is there. They're following the same principles that can be applied for the knee and, and, and the hip. So I think there's always something that can be done and it's safe enough to try. But um, the, the thing is, I, I wish there was promises and guarantees, but it, it, you, you ultimately have to uh, get to know the person with the joint pain, the arthritis, and see if you can individualize the treatment to try to help, help that person with the joint pain. Okay, so that's the end of our set of questions. I'd like to extend a big thank you to UCLA Health and to Dr. Tarr for lending his expertise tonight. And I've certainly learned a lot. I found it really interesting uh, learning more about these techniques, hearing some of the evidence uh, behind them, and also getting my head around this uh, holistic approach, which I think is really, really interesting to hear as a patient. I'm really excited about finding out more and uh, potentially some of, using some of these new tools in my own. Uh, routine uh, treatment and self-care. So before we sign off for the night, um, I'd just like to remind you that we have several resources and events coming up to help you manage your arthritis. We've got some webinars and um, we've got three webinars coming up. The first one is a Facebook Live on strength and resistance training for arthritis. And in this Facebook Live, you will learn practical tips for a well-balanced strength routine, whether you're just getting started or have been a gym goer for years. And that's coming up on October 27th, um, 6 to 7 to 15 p.m. Eastern time. Our next webinar is all about fats and the good, the bad, and the in-between for arthritis overview. And in this webinar, you learn about the role of fat in an anti-inflammatory diet for arthritis including which kinds to eat and which to avoid. And that's on November the 10th, again, 6 to 7.15 Eastern time. And then we've got our Live Yes RA overview. In this program, RA patients will learn vital tools to help manage their disease. And that's November the 17th, again, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can find out all about these webinars and register if you go to arthritis.org forward slash webinars. And our insight program, another reminder, please take the insights assessment to help the Arthritis Foundation deliver more events like these. And again, you can find that on arthritis.org. This time it's forward slash insights. So as a closing reminder, uh, just to remember that in a few days, you will receive a survey asking about your experience. Please take the time to fill the survey out completely and honestly, so that the Arthritis Foundation can best serve you in the future. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Take care.